It's my pleasure to introduce my co-chairman and our friend, Dr. C.M. Nguyen. Uh, he is the professor of uh, uh, medicine and cardiology in the Prince Wells Hospital, Chinese University of Hong Kong. He's the director of the uh, clinical sciences of the Institute of Vascular Medicine and the director of heart education at RCS. You are very welcome, uh, Professor Son. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kassam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure to be invited uh, as part of the board member and also participate in this important meeting. Uh, so uh, this session is about heart failure with preserved ejection fashion, which is actually a very challenging uh, disease to manage. I would even say that it's not a single entity of disease, but it is a syndrome that I think we have to pay more attention in the nowadays management. Now, if you look into the um, guidelines, uh, usually uh, it refers to patients with heart failure signs and symptoms with reduced ejection fashion. And um, uh, that is what, it, you know, in typically that we describe as heart failure with reduced EF or previously called systolic heart failure. And that we usually will use ejection fashion less than 40% as the definition. Now, what about HFPF, uh, which is a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved EF? Usually, uh, nowadays, we refer to a EF of more than 50%. However, bear in mind that different ejection fashion has been used in different studies before, such as 40%, 45%, and so on. And it was previously called diastolic heart failure. And we also have heard about many stories about treatment of this condition. Now, I think you have seen this slide many times. I think the main message, of course, is that HFPEF is a condition with increasing prevalence among uh, all parts of the world uh, without any exception. And co when compared with HFPEF, you can see that those heart failure with reduced ejection fashion actually slightly getting a better trend of reduction. Per presumably, it might be related to the better therapy that we can offer to many risk factors that might lead to systolic heart failure. Now, uh, if you uh, you like to examine the prevalence of HFPEF on different uh, disease population, in fact, it's quite variable, and you can see that in fact HFPEF could easily occupy about half of the population uh, in the acute heart failure population. And in Hong Kong, we have found that uh, a study that we performed uh, by Professor Sanderson before found that about 55% of the patient admitted to the heart failure uh, hospital is related to the HFPEF. Now, here are the few characteristics of HFPEF. First of all, it's usually targeting on older population. Somehow, it got a female predominant, which might be related to longevity as well. You will find very high prevalence of hypertension and also there will be higher um, prevalence of um, high blood pressure together also with left ventricular hypertrophy on assessment. And these are namely, you know, the common causes of diastolic dysfunction, suffice to say, explaining why heart failure is more prevalent in these conditions. Now, in terms of the diagnosis, we know that the diagnosis is always more difficult than those patients with reduced EF. First of all, is a diagnosis largely by exclusion. We have to exclude the non-cardiac causes that may have symptoms of heart failure, such as anemia or other uh, causes of high output failure. And usually, uh, in patients with HFPEF, they do not have a dilated left ventricle until the disease may reach another status. And also, there might be increase in the left ventricle wall thickness, and also um, there will be evidence of diastolic dysfunction of the heart. Therefore, we have to satisfy these conditions when the patient presented uh, to the clinic with heart failure. First of all, they have to have typical symptoms and signs of heart failure. And also, uh, we have to find evidence to differentiate these patients from reduced EF leading to heart failure. Uh, first of all, usually the LV is not dilated or only mildly dilated. Secondly, um, there might be relevant structural heart uh, disease such as left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, and together with evidence of diastolic dysfunction. 
Now, uh, diastolic dysfunction is the main pathophysiologic mechanism that underlies the development of high feeling pressure and therefore heart failure um, development. So let's spend some time on how we can assess diastolic dysfunction based on the use of Doppler echocardiography. So here is a list of useful parameters on Doppler echocardiography. Typ typically, we have to measure the transmitral filling on Doppler echo and together maybe with some additional maneuver to identify different patterns or severity of diastolic dysfunction such as well server maneuver uh, and so on. Uh, now if necessary we might also have to assess other uh, methods such as the so-called pulmonary weakness filling Doppler signals and also we have to make use of tissue Doppler to assess the early diastolic velocities of the myocardium and with that we can actually derive a lot of parameters. So here is the transmitral Doppler parameters and here is the normal uh, Doppler signal that complies a E wave and A wave and typically the E wave is larger than the A wave velocity. Now when the heart starts to getting more stiff and also the ventricle getting uh, more hypertrophy there will be evidence of delayed relaxation pattern that we call the abnormal relaxation and with that there will be a reduction of the E velocity and increase in the A velocity and also and prolongation of the deceleration time of the E wave. Now when feeling pressure getting higher that also affect both the left ventricular and the left atrial feeling pressure and there will be progressive evolution into restrictive feeling pattern in that which is characterized by a large E wave, a small A wave and also a short deceleration time typically less than 140 milliseconds and the E and the A ratio is typically larger than 2 and the A wave is small also maybe because of atrial mechanical failure that develop. Now here is an additional uh, marker that we make use which is the so called E over E prime. So this is a combined um, uh, measurement of the ratio between the transmitral E wave velocity sorry, and the tissue Doppler velocity at the septal mitral annulus which is measured over here. So usually the E prime velocity it should be bigger, greater than 8 or 8.5. Now in here when we measure the ratio between E over E prime it will be a marker for the flame pressure so it acts as a catheter to measure the hemodynamics of the left ventricle. So typically if you find E over E prime larger than 15 that will be a marker of elevated filling pressure. So you can see that this patient actually got very high pressure despite the fact that, that this patient only got a relatively mild form of diastolic dysfunction. So to summarize the Doppler findings, we can actually nowadays classify um, diastolic dysfunction into abnormal relaxation which is grade 1, pseudo normalization grade 2, restrictive filling pattern grade 3 which is reversible and also irreversible RFP which is grade 4. Now you can actually find that um, the pseudo normalized patient is unable to be differentiated by the transmitral Doppler wave, uh, waveform assessment because they got an identical E and A wave as normal. However, these, pay, these people usually have a reduce in the D prime velocity on tissue Doppler and also on pulmonary weakness assessment usually there will be a forward uh, systolic forward and the diastolic waveform and in those patients with pseudo normalization pattern you can see that sometimes there will be reversal of the uh, S and the D relationship and also exaggeration of the atrial revo uh, reversal uh, velocity. Therefore when we have encountered patient with ejection fashion of more than 40% uh, or a so-called relatively normal uh, systolic function, we can assess E over E prime. If the E over E prime is less than 8, that usually indicates a normal left atrial filling pressure and also let normal left ventricular pressure. When E over E prime is over 15, sorry about the misprint, 
uh, over 15, usually the left ventricular and left atrial pressure is high. And for a pressure between 9, over 9 to 14, it's an indeterminate range from by uva E prime. And under those situations, we should ask um, for more parameters, such as whether there's any atrial enlargement, whether there's any increase in the so-called atrial reversal over the A wave time difference, or by using well server maneuver, whether you can convert um, a pseudo normal pattern into a uh, e, uh, EA ratio of more than 05. So here is more or less the same from, you know, that is extracted from PVC from the European um, guidelines and basically it suggests that for those patients who actually got signs and symptoms of heart failure, we have to make use of echocardiography, tissue Doppler imaging, and of course we should consider the combined use of biomarkers, um, that means a anti-pro-BNP of more than 220 picogram per milliliter or the BNP of more than 200 uh, as a marker of ab abnormal um, uh, myocardial function leading to the diagnosis of HFPEF. So further to this, again, uh, this is actually a recap of what has been mentioned. By combining the use of echo biomarkers, we should be able to derive consistently whether these patients are either having no heart failure, despite they have a sense of breath, or this patient might actually have a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction if the EF is abnormal, or whether this patient is actually having a half path. Now, in fact, um, half path is not a very simple condition. Uh, as I mentioned, it's actually a more heterogeneous disease, and it actually complies of very different etiological factors and many different causes. Therefore, nowadays, people are actually talking about different phenotypes of heart failure in half path. Now, from our early study, we have already illustrated that in these patients, they are not simply just having diastolic dysfunction of the heart, but in fact, they also have systolic, systolic abnormalities as illustrated by tissue Doppler imaging. Now here is the study that we actually make use of tissue Doppler to assess the systolic velocities on the basal segments of the left ventricle. Now when you compare with the normal subjects, you can see that those patients with diastolic heart failure, sorry, diastolic dysfunction, they already have a reduction of the systolic velocities. When it comes to the group of half path, there is about 52% of these patients actually got significant reduction of the systolic velocities. And this here is those patients with half ref the reduced EF patient, who got a more drastic reduction of the systolic velocities. So in fact, it is a disease that actually um, have subclinical systolic dysfunction. This is the early diastolic velocity on tissue Doppler. Again, for, by comparing with the controls, those patients with diastolic dysfunction um, have have and also the half ref, they have progressive reduction of the diastolic velocities as well. So therefore, here is the group of the patient that actually deserve more diagnostic um, uh, consent, um, uh, atten um, uh, attention because here is the group that usually we say they might have a normal systolic function because their ejection fraction is over 50 50%. However, if you examine tissue Doppler velocity very carefully, here is the cutoff value derived from our large population of 200 patients. So the mean value is 4.4 um, centimeters per second by color tissue Doppler imaging. Now you can see that there is a substantial of population fall below this normal value and largely contributed by those patients with half path and a smaller extent those patients with diastolic dysfunction without heart failure. So this is a typical myocardial velocity profile on TDI. This is a normal subject with a largest e, e, uh, S wave during systole and also E wave during early diastole. So here is a patient with diastolic dysfunction. You can see the progressive reduction of the velocity envelope in those patients with half path and also those patients with systolic heart failure. Now, uh, lately, we also have another study that make use of the 2D speckle tracking assessment. Again, we actually find more or less similar relationship. And here is the so-called end-systolic stress-corrected longitudinal strain. So strain is a measure of deformation of the myocardium. And you can actually find from here uh, there is a scatter with the controls and there is certain overlap between controls and those patients with half path but you can see that 
those patients with half path they largely have reduced in the um, in the systolic strain despite they have a relatively normal ejection fashion and this is a group of patients with systolic heart failure with a very reduced uh, longitudinal strain therefore in fact systolic function again is not normal in those patients uh, with uh, half path and here is the measurement of the torsion or the twisting motion of the heart again it could be a marker of systolic function and you can also see that those patients suffering from heart failure uh, uh, have path also got significant reduction of the torsion and the twisting motion of the heart. Therefore, in fact, in actual practice, I believe that those patients with diastolic heart failure, um, um, I mean, isolated diastolic dysfunction is probably at the pendulum of more a earlier disease development. Now, when these patients develop clinical phenotype of heart failure, we might call that this patient as diastolic heart failure or half path. And this patient already have some degree of subclinical myocardial systolic dysfunction develop. Now when this when the disease progress then and also maybe with a mixture of different etiological factors, there will be a com combination of systolic and diastolic dysfunction, usually when presented as systolic heart failure as the dominant features. Now uh, the, is the prognosis of these patients the same? Although from some earlier studies, it said that maybe the long-term prognosis is more or less similar. However, we have increasing um, experience and evidence that in fact, half path patients actually do a slightly better in terms of the prognosis. And here we actually examine the short-term uh, one-year mortality. Clearly that those patients who got recent experience of systolic heart failure, they will be doing a lot worse than those patients with half path. And in fact, this, this message is also being further confirmed by the recent meta analysis, as shown in here. Uh, actually, find that those patients with half path actually got a lower mortality, even when adjusted for many, um, uh, many demographic factors, including age, gender, etiology of heart failure, and also other comorbid conditions. Now, uh, another uh, uh, situation uh, or another pathophysiologic mechanism uh, that uh, underlies the development of heart failure might be related to mechanical dyssynchrony of the heart, which is a matter of uncoordinated contraction or relaxation of the heart. First, this is uh, you know, one of our earliest work, which is actually the first work uh, that published about the occurrence of mechanical dyssynchrony in patient with uh, half path that we label as diastolic heart failure at that time. Now you can find that in these patients, 39% uh, uh, of patients with half path will have evidence of systolic dyssynchrony, and 36% of these patients will have diastolic dyssynchrony. Of course, the prevalence of dyssynchrony is much higher uh, in those population with systolic heart failure, which is 57 and 43 percent, respectively. Now, interestingly, uh, these patients, they might not only have uh, uh, isolated dyssynchrony, in fact, some of these patients could have a combined diastolic and systolic dyssynchrony, although, again, the prevalence is much higher in the subject with systolic heart failure. But then I think the main message is that for those patients who develop synchrony in the condition of half path, they usually belong to the population who got a relatively narrow or normal KRS compress duration, which is less than 120 milliseconds. So this is an example of a patient with half path. You can see that uh, there is scattering of the systolic peak velocities, and also there is in uncoordinated peaking of the diastolic velocity. So clearly, there is a combined systolic and diastolic dyssynchrony of the heart. This is the work from my uh, good friend, Dr. John Wan Ha from Seoul. So he actually developed a method of also measuring some myocardial functional reserve. Because these, uh, you know, in those patients with half half, the lack of exercise or stress-induced myocardial reserve may be an important mechanism of heart failure. So if, uh, if we can assess this during exercise, so this is some of the way we can actually calculate and measure the change of the systolic or the diastolic velocity in order to calculate myocardial systolic and diastolic reserve during stress.
In fact, this is actually a piece of elegant work performed by uh, Professor Sanderson uh, uh, in UK. Um, and he actually shown that those patients uh, with uh, HFPF, they actually have a reduction of the myocardial exercise reserve. So this here is a patient uh, comparing resting and exercise. You can see that there is only a small increase in systolic velocity and also there is a small increase in the diastolic velocity from 4.4 to 5 centimeters per second. And here is a patient uh, with in, uh, if here is a normal subject, you can see that the diastolic velocity actually increased from 6 to 9.5 centimeters per second during stress test. So here is another way of looking into the data by examining the longitudinal strain. Again, there is evidence of a reduction of the strain value um, on exercise. In particular, there is a blunting of increase in the myocardial velocity. Now, this is relevant because from our experience, we actually find that uh, the reduction of myocardial reserve, uh, both systolic and diastolic reserve, might be a major contributor for the development of exercise intolerance and even the worsening of heart failure. So this is a study that we published in European Heart Journal a few years ago. We try to compare uh, again, a rest, in, a rest and stress systolic velocity and early diastolic velocity in three groups of subjects. Uh, the normal controls, those patients with left ventricular hypertrophy without heart failure, and those patients with half path. Now you can see that there is a significant blunting of systolic velocities in both disease groups, but more so in those with half path. And it's more dramatic, however, the, there will be almost total absence of the early diastolic myocardial reserve in those patients with half half. Now, what intrigues us is also on the status of myocardial dyssynchrony in that study. We actually find that in normal subjects, as expected, there is very little dyssynchrony for both systolic dyssynchrony and early diastolic dyssynchrony. However, myocardial dyssynchrony increased during stress uh, substantially in those patients with half path and there's also some increase in those patients with LVH. However, this is the extent is much greater in those patients with half path for increase in the systolic dyssynchrony. And here you can see that almost every patient during exercise and during stress will develop diastolic dyssynchrony. So therefore, we believe that this dyssynchrony might play a pivotal role in the development of heart failure. Therefore, in conclusion, HFPEF is a disease of high prevalence in aging population and hypertension, and perhaps more, more in the female gender. Echocardiography will play a role, pivotal role in the diagnosis of heart failure because we have to make sure that this patient got a relatively preserved ejection fraction and have cardinal evidence of diastolic dysfunction of the heart. Now, the definition is half path is arbitrary, and possibly that may indicate a milder form of heart failure in the spectrum. And perhaps nowadays, the, the, the concept evolved that there is a, a different spectrum of phenotypes of heart failure leading to the half path. I think subclinical systolic dysfunction is quite common in this condition, which is present in half of the patients with half path. I think we have to address their systolic function issue. Furthermore, in HFPEF, there is a reduction of myocardial contractile and relaxation reserve, which is an important clinical feature and may play a role in the diagnosis. And we have also observed that both systolic and diastolic dyssynchrony is common in HFPEF, though the prevalence will be different and slightly lower from those with systolic heart failure. And lastly, stress-induced dyssynchrony is very common in HFPEF and even um, the dyssynchrony is actually absent at rest. That might actually play a powerful physiologic role in the exercise intolerance and development of heart failure symptoms. So with that, I will actually thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, CM. I think we have one, one uh, time for just one short straightforward question. Gilson, yeah, please go ahead. Well, congratulations on this very comprehensive review. Thank you. Do, you. do you find a possible role for biomarkers in distinguishing early phases of half path? Uh, 
Well, that will be a you know a challenging situation. We are also being you know also at the verge of conducting some studies to look into that. Now, first of all, I'm I'm, I'm sure that um, Professor Michael Hannon will actually give, will give a very, you know a comprehensive review on the biomarkers. As far as we know, uh, biomarkers is helpful. However, there has been also some earlier reports and consistently uh, showing that some patients with HFPF they might not have significant elevation of biomarkers. Uh, therefore, it comes back, you know, also with two situations, whether HFPEF is a milder form of heart failure or whether HFPEF will have different phenotypes. Some of the phenotypes may have more, you know, generation of the bi certain biomarkers. Therefore, to answer your question, I think um, there might be some uh, biomarkers is useful, but we have not seen a, a, a unanimous role of using certain biomarkers consistently making the diagnosis of HFF at this moment. So there is still some clinical challenge.